All right, welcome to the conversation on the TYT Network. I'm your host, Jake Uger. Uh, well, we're going to talk about a historical figure that uh, has possible ramifications for today. It certainly has ramifications in that we all follow his policies. And uh, Democrats follow it and Republicans follow it. If you're wondering who it is, well, it's John Maynard Keynes. And, uh, and Zach Carter, who's an excellent reporter at HuffPost, senior reporter over there, has written a book about him called The Price of Peace, uh, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. And uh, Zach joins us now. Uh, Zach, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Great to see you again, Jay. Yep, good to see you. All right, so first question, Zach, is uh, why this book? I mean, you write about a lot of different topics, and you had a thousand things to choose from. Why Keynes? I ultimately think that Keynes is a philosopher of crisis. We think about him as somebody who... Uh, most people encounter Keynes as, as the guy who tells tells governments to spend money in a recession, right? To, to build up big budget deficits, to lift economies out of depression. Um, but I, I really think there's a lot more going on there. He's, he's a philosopher of crisis, and this is an age of crisis. And the way that he thinks about societies on the verge of, of calamity, I think, is uh, is really essential to the way that, uh, that we engage reality in our own time. Who is he as a person? Well, Keynes comes from a very uh, upper middle class, uh, sort of casually elite background in uh, in, in British academia. His, his father is uh, an economist at Cambridge University. Uh, he, he grows up around Cambridge and he has all these friends who are similarly elite, but not necessarily financially comfortable elites. They're people who come from enough money to get to Cambridge University, uh, enough money to think about art and leisure and ideas and, and, and aesthetics as, as things that are important in, in, in life, but, but not people who are, who are so comfortable that they can just ignore the financial realities of the real world. Uh, and so when they, when they get out of Cambridge together, they're all kind of stunned. They're like, okay, what do we do? How do we, how do we make ends meet? And they decide that they're going to make ends meet by, by writing books and partying together. Uh, and it's really quite a scene. It's called it's called the Bloomsbury set, uh, and and Bloomsbury is sort of one uh, installment in this international uh, milieu that that is is part of the the sort of leisure class we, we might say of of the turn of the century. So there there are installments of this in in Saint Petersburg in Russia. They're in Paris. They're they're in Frankfurt and and Munich and and in New York. And and the London version of this is 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 Bloomsbury, and Keynes is really one of the luminaries in the set. His his other friends are people like Virginia Woolf, one of the most famous English writers from the 20th century, and they just sort of hang out and write things to each other. And they're not famous. They they're they're not world renowned artists or or aesthetes or anything at this point in time, uh, but they but they think of themselves as being world-renowned artists and aesthetes at, the, at this point in time. And yet it's not until the world really comes into crisis that, that John Maynard Keynes really makes a name for himself. So he's almost 30 years old. He's more than 30 years old, frankly, uh, when uh, b before anyone thinks of or cares about his economic ideas. He's mostly just this guy who hangs out uh, in a particularly you know artistic neighborhood of London with people like Virginia Woolf uh, talking about books. Yeah, this leisure class sounds amazing. Uh <laughs> but, uh, but he did at least care about other human beings and, uh, and certainly cared a lot about inequality. But so what's the brand of economics that um, uh, he espoused and that wound up taking off and why? Well, Keynes is a complicated guy. He, he starts off as, as this devout servant of the British, uh, the British Empire while it's going to war. So he, he really makes a name for himself during the First World War. Uh, as as the guy who manages the British Empire's finances, and it's a complicated thing for him because he's against the First World War. He thinks that this is a bad war. He thinks it's about nothing. He thinks it's about imperialism, and that this is the, these things are bad for the world. And he he doesn't want to be part of it. But he's also very good at managing finances, and he's always wanted to work for the British Treasury because he sees that as being very prestigious. So he's conflicted. Uh, the economics that he develops, uh, the, the the real uh, innovation he has within economics is is trying is sort of seeing the economic system as a whole as being different from the economic decisions of individuals. So he he gets to this realization as a result of being sort of an imperial manager during the war. This is not something that I think I think most leftists today would look at and say like, oh, hooray. 
this guy was managing war finances uh, in for the British Empire in the First World War. But he ultimately develops this uh, set of ideas into uh, it, he combines it with his his much more deeper phil philosophical commitments in, into a, a way of thinking about how to manage society as a whole, which says, look, if you want to avoid calamities like the First World War, you have to do things to take care of society that that allow people to feel like they are taken care of by the state. If if people feel like they are subjected to these these deep swings of in reality, uh, these uncertainties about the future, uh, if they don't feel like they're financially protected, they're going to do things that are bad. They're going to support bad ideas. Uh, and so he ends up supporting, you know, a, a pretty robust welfare state and and the alleviation of inequality as as a sort of way of protecting the world against uh, against international conflict, which, you know, he, he viewed the, the First World War as sort of like the worst thing that could ever happen. He, he wanted to, to, to keep that from happening again. Yeah. So, well, he was right on a lot of counts. It was up until that point the worst thing that had happened. Uh, it was largely over nothing and imperialism. Uh, and and uh, well, when uh, the British government went towards protecting its own citizens more from those calamities, it remained a vibrant democracy. Uh, and when the German government couldn't do that and they had an economy that was in shambles, they built a war machine and started a war that was even worse. So he was proven right on a lot of counts. Um, so, but as things stand today for people unfamiliar, what is the core of Keynesian economics? The way that we understand him uh, has been sort of, his legacy has been written by economists. And so people think about his great innovation in economics is, well, you should, you should spend money in a recession to help lift uh, your, your economy out of, out of the doldrums. And, and look, that's part of his that's part of his legacy. It's it's really there. But he's a much broader thinker. I mean, he was the guy who he was the financial architect of the National Health Service for Great Britain. So, you know, socializing British medicine, that was John Maynard Keynes, probably his greatest policy success of his entire life. Uh, he, he did not wake up every morning and say, hey, I hope people will someday remember me and think about uh, about deficit spending. He wanted to think. He he wanted to, he wanted people to think about economics not as a science of of money and numbers, but as a way of 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 taking care of societies to protect them from the kind of disasters uh, that he saw in World War One, and frankly, I think we're seeing right now in COVID nineteen. Uh, this this type of of calamity, uh, aside from all of the you know technical you know disasters that uh, the Trump administration has has perpetrated, um, that this. This disaster has been bad because we have not taken care of our society in a lot of other ways that I think John Maynard Keynes would have said. Look, if you if you protect society from from so, bad things are bound to happen. Bad things happen all the time. But if you have a set of of sort of shock absorbers for ordinary people, then then the things don't have to get that bad once once, once the calamity arrives. Here's a guy who was in favor of uh, government spending. Uh, nationalized medicine and was deeply concerned about inequality and needless wars. So uh, what on God's earth are we talking about when we say Republican presidents also are uh, believers in reality of Keynesian economics? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a tricky thing because he, he lived for so long and he wrote so many things for, for so much of, of his life uh, that there, there are people who can pick and choose different things from his life and legacy and say, this is this is the thing that mattered. Um, but look, he was an imperial manager for the British government uh, in an era of, of constant violence and war. So if you want to run an empire and run up big deficits with military spending, uh, you can turn to Keynes and say, look, this guy says that running up big deficits will not bankrupt our country uh, and we can afford it. And that's what Republicans have done since, uh, you know, from Eisenhower forward, really, uh, with the Korean War, uh, with Vietnam under uh, under Johnson, and uh, not, Johnson's obviously not a Republican, but Richard Nixon's escalation of the Vietnam War, um, clearly under Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and Donald Trump, we've we've been spending an enormous amount of money on uh, on wars and and cutting taxes for the rich, uh, and under Keynesian economics, that that doesn't necessarily lead to economic ruin. It doesn't, it doesn't make your, your economy stop functioning. Uh, and so they have a point. But I, I think someone like John Maynard Keynes 
I think certainly John Maynard Keynes himself would say that that's that's still appalling. Like, why would why would you do that? Why would you organize society in such a way? He he wanted people to be able to uh, enjoy the the beautiful things that his friends in Bloomsbury enjoy, enjoyed: art, literature, uh, love. He he had he had no interest in in war. He he was trying to he was trying to stop wars. We find out all about that and more uh, in the book The Price of Peace. Zach Carter, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for watching this free clip of the Young Turks. Don't forget to become a TYT member today. For more exclusive content, join now at tyt.com/join.